So already we can see changes. And we realize this is what we need to do, invest in these people. So now we are changing now to really invest in people. As we are still paying the school fees, but our key now and our focus has now started changing to invest in the community. So that if we invest in the families to find solution to the problem the families are facing, because I realize too, if you pay for one child, which is good, but average kids in Kenya is five to 10. If you pay for one child to go to school, you have six or more that are just staying at home. By the time that person graduates and gets the education, you know, it's, 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 it's an investment that it takes longer to get the returns. But if you invest in projects that puts money, and the project also is self-sustaining, it doesn't need to be, because once you put a cooler there and you put them in a cooperative, and they have a good, you, you teach them good business strategies, then they become business people, and then the project self runs itself. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that really I, I think, and as, as, as I sit in Africa and I, I see Africa, I really think as we move forward, as now in this room, with people with a heart of helping Africa or helping these poor people, I've realized one thing, being there as a leader, is first of all to learn what is their need. After learning what is their need, invest in the people. If we can invest in the people, then we'll be able to solve the problems. Yeah, and, and also, and they can, yeah, they can solve their own problems, but also we can invest in, in projects that are self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. Self-sustainability is a key. Otherwise, we'll be you know, and, and as, I, as, I, as I visit my, as I lead my people and as I walk around my, my area, I see a lot of things. Like, say for example, um, a couple of years ago, when I was young, I remember very well when I was young, a Swedish government came to Kenya and they, they drilled wells. Right, in my village, I remember they were drilling wells like crazy. But I remember very well when I was young, I remember it was just group of white people coming with big machines, <laughs> drilling wells. Unfortunately, after five years, all the wells were broken. Right? When I went around my constituency, I could, every school, I could go to a school or a village and I would see a broken well. People are still going to, to dirty water or they don't have water. So people are asking me, we need water, we need water. And I'm going and I'm like, you have a well. So I realized all these wells are broken. There's nobody who knows how to fix it. So what I did, me and my wife, we found a, an organization in Novo called Waterstep that teaches people how to fix wells. Mm -hmm. So they have a practical lessons on how you, go, you fix wells. So I did, and my wife, we took the lessons. We went there, put our sleeves up, learned how to fix a well. So we learned how to fix a well, and some policemen from Louvre, about five of them, they came and they were like, oh, you are, you are learning how to, I told them the story about, we have a lot of wells that are broken. So they were like, okay, we'll take the, the classes with you. So they took the classes with us, <laughs> they came over to Kenya. Mm. So we went to every well, we fixed the well, but also we, tell, we call the community and we tell them, because now I'm a leader, right? And so I call them, every time I go there, they will come. Even I don't have to call them, they come. <laughs> so, but I tell them, okay, now we're here, we're going to fix this well, but we want somebody to educate on how to fix this well. And let me tell you, as we were fixing those wells, as we pull the, you know, all the stuff out, we go to the pump. You know what was broken? It's a little casket at the bottom of the, of the pump. It costed less than a dollar. Wow. Right? It costed less than a dollar, but for more than 10 years, it has just been sitting there. And people have not been enjoying. So, but if those people came and invested in the community, mm -hmm. and let even the community themselves take part in building and drilling the wells, and in installing the wells, and having one person there who knows how to do it, you will have known that this thing only cost you less than a dollar to fix, and people would have enjoyed that a lot. So, you know, as we move forward uh, with our philanthropic work, uh, I, I realize let's 
let's change the way we do things. Mm. And it's then, honestly, as I look at, at the future of Kenya, first of all, we invest in good leaders. That's key. We invest in good leadership. If you find a good leader that you can invest on, mm -hmm. and then work with them, you know, work with them to be able to learn the community. After you learn the community, then you can really know what is the problem they have. Mm -hmm. But also, the, let's, let's invest in projects that are self-sustaining. Like right now, another project that me and my wife started last year uh, was we started a project of uniform making project. Because one thing I realized, for those people who have been in Kenya, you realize every school has a uniform. Every, every child wears a uniform, right? But where do the parents, where do they buy a uniform from? From the towns and the cities, from the Indians who import them and come sell them. So last year, me and my wife said, okay, let's we invest our own money. And we, 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 we found a polytechnic in my village that was built by a priest from the Netherlands. So a priest came and built a, a polytechnic in the village. So, but this polytechnic was not being used. Nobody goes there. So I went there and visited there with my wife. And the grass was like this big. Ah, nice building. Sewing machines were very beautiful. So I called the priest and I was like, uh, what is this building doing? He's like, I built a building, but nobody wants to use it. So me and my wife were like, why don't we use this building to produce uniforms? So, so right there, we, we talked to the priest and we talked to the, 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 the people and we, we, we found people that know how to sew. We bought the materials and we went to three schools in my village. And that's the advantage of me being a member of parliament, right? <laughs> I can go and talk to the head teachers because... And then also we have this, we have the CDF, for those who know, Community Development Fund. So I am the patron of the CDF. So in the CDF, you have part of it. Normally those are supposed to build schools and build, you know, build all these other infrastructures. So part of it, you, it, is, it is Basel, where you give people for, 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 for Basel. So what we did was we allocated some amount of money to put as bursary, but to use it as to buy uniform for the kids. So we went and produced uniform in this school, hired people, we hired about 10 people to produce about 200 uniforms. Mm -hmm. And we took tenders in three schools. And at the beginning of the year, we supplied uniform to those schools. Mm -hmm. So every child that was coming there was getting a free uniform. And the cost of production for a uniform was a half what they were buying at the, uh, at the market. But we have provided, we have provided jobs. Yeah. We have utilized the facilities that are not utilized. And also, we have empowered the community. Yes. So, to me, I feel like those are the projects that you know, will really put back the money in the community. And then also, at the end of the year, the money that we put comes back. Back, it runs the community, it runs the project again. All you need again is maybe to inject more capital because right now we are trying to, to because we have already gotten tenders from about 10 schools to produce uniform for them because people have realized it's cheaper to produce uniform there than to go to buy in the town. Sure. So you have, you have now 10 schools that want you to produce uniform. So those are the, I think as we move forward, and uh, what I would like to encourage you guys is continue doing what you're doing in the, in, in, no matter what you're doing, you know, like if it's teaching, education, or anything, but let's focus on investing in the community so that tomorrow when you're not there, the community continues. Because if you invest in the community, the community becomes stronger. And when the community becomes stronger, if you invest in the families, the families become stronger. When the families become stronger, then the community becomes stronger. When the community becomes stronger, then the country becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. And I think that is how we're going to solve the problems we are facing in the world. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, your job becomes easy because you're not going to teach. The, you know, the problem we have is when, well, like when I went to Africa, when I went back home to Kenya, in my mind I was like, I'm going to change, I'm going to change Kenya. I'm going to change people. Bad mentality to have. <laughs> Very bad mentality to have. 
<laughs> because they might change you even when you're changing them. But the key is, you don't go there with an intention of changing them, but you go there with an intention of making them better. Absolutely. Right? You make them better on what they're doing. If you can make them better in what they're doing, then they see, they see even, like, they see you as one of them. Otherwise, if you go there and you try to change them, they repel, right? Like, for example, even, for example, they, they, and, and I talked to the priest about this idea, and I learned a lot from that, because when the priest came and built the, the, the polytechnic there, because from the same village, uh, I was getting proposals from the same village, from the same village. I was getting proposals to build another polytechnic from the same village. And even there's another polytechnic that had already been started by the guy that was before me. <laughs> it's another polytechnic next to the polytechnic. Why? I asked the people, why are you building another? He's like, that's not ours. That is for the white people. That's not ours. Because they were not involved mm -hmm. in the process of doing what? Of building it. But now when we brought the idea of uniform making in the project, you can see now even people are coming more. Now people even are want to come and take classes there because now they feel like now it's open. And I, I had to call even the older men of the community to talk to them that this thing belongs to you. It does not belong to the white people, it belongs to you. They just helped you to build it. Right? So if we can take that mentality. Like me, when I grew up, I used to think the wells belong to the white people. Right? I used to think this well is not mine. It's for the, don't touch it. Yeah, it's for the white people. <laughs> so, you know, so if you have that mentality, like, so we have, to, we have, that's one thing that we, I'm talking from the perspective of the Kenyans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because I've been there, right? I've been there and I, I know, and I grew up seeing things, thing happen. Uh, also, another thing that I want to, to, that we need to prevent a lot, that I see is a very big, bad, serious issue, that even the politicians of Kenyans have done, the government of Kenya does it, is creating what is called dependency syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dependency syndrome is what is killing Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because nobody wants to do anything. People are just waiting for you to come and give them. Give them. They, they do this, give, give. No, we have to change that. We have to tell them we will help you become better if you work hard, if you become a better person. Like, for example, there's a friend of mine, uh, who went to Lodwa? <coughs> Lodwa, you all know Lodwa, the desert part of Kenya, and southern Sudan. So he went to southern, like southern Sudan, very good fertile land, very good fertile land. They can grow their crops, even Lodwa have, has water, and they can grow their crops there. Right? But, so my friend went there, and he was trying to teach them how to farm effectively. You know, like he went to southern Sudan, he was trying to teach them on how to use, you know, their big bulls to you know, to cultivate the land and plant well. Nobody wanted to plant. Yeah. Nobody wanted to plant. So he calls me and he's like, Wesley, these people do not want to learn. I am calling meeting, I'm trying to teach them. No, he's just looking at them. So I went there with him one time and I tried to talk to these people like, why don't you guys, somebody is here to help you. And he's like, why do we have to learn? Why? Because when there's no food and there's no, and there's hunger, and we see people with big TV, they come, they take our pictures, they're on TV, the following day, planes are landing with food. Yeah. Right? And I was like, this is the problem. Right? So they have re just realized that why do we have to try? Because when we don't need it, when we don't have it, they come. So are we helping or are we destroying? So, you know, those are the things that really, as, as, as I grow up and as I live in Africa, and I just want to be honest with you from the bottom of my heart, is we need to relook at things. It is good to, 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 be, to give, and I, I, I really love even what uh, uh, some of, our, of you guys are doing. Uh, I think it's an eye-opening. If you are there, if you live in Africa, like the way I've lived, come to America, lived in America, learn the culture here, know how people here are, and go back home, and see how things are there, uh, I'm like, okay, we need to do things different. We need to do things different. Thank you. Well, I congratulate you.